Today on the show, I'm happy to have John Bucknell. He's the CEO of Virtus Solis. They're a clean firm, scalable energy from space. And we were just talking about resetting your career eight times and how at the end of the day, looking back, it did prepare you exactly for where you are today. I had exited undergraduate in the summer of 1995. Boeing laid off 30,000 people a month graduate. I'm an aerospace engineer by interest, by training. My dad worked on the Apollo program, but I wasn't wor- willing to work on missiles. So I looked around, read the newspapers, and ended up taking a job in Detroit as an automotive engineer. The good news is that automotive was a very stable industry at the time, probably still is to a large degree. There's a large number of engineers in Detroit who could learn a lot. I spent 15 years working on automotive, or uh, I got headhunted out to go run advanced propulsion at SpaceX. And I ran the Raptor engine program. I was the first principal engineer and also responsible for the big Falcon rocket, which turned in the Starship and Super Heavy. So that was in 2011. And I managed to last there about a year and a half before I ran afoul of being the oldest person in the organization and telling Elon no, providing ideas that weren't favorably looked upon the time. I lost my job at SpaceX, but looking back a decade later, they did every single thing I told them to do, which is, hey, we should be going to the moon first and we should be maybe putting reactors on Mars and surface solar isn't going to work great. It also had a role in the throttling of the rocket engines to allow uh, reusable rocketry to actually work so you could land the thing. It ended up putting me back in Detroit, taking another job, but learning a lot about software controls. And then I joined another startup in Los Angeles called Divergent Technologies. I was employee number two there. They are and have been developing additive manufacturer for large engineered structures. I've been working on automotive is that's a very large uh, field, but they also recently did a drone for general atomics. But that, uh, that field was very ripe for innovation. I personally have about 40 industry foundational patents in that area around generative design, using artificial intelligence and added manufacturing, all of those. And I spent a number of their years there running an engineering organization. And the experience running two or running departments or engineering orgs inside of two startups convinced me to start my own. So after 28 years in industry, I decided to spin off and work on space based solar power. Space based solar power wasn't my first choice, but Looking at the opportunities to make a space happen is a thing where people can do business and live and work. You need the basic infrastructure. So looking around at all the businesses that can make money in space with no infrastructure, launch, there's 137 launch businesses out there. So developing another launch business probably wasn't the greatest idea. Internet of space are already heavily populated. Earth observation doesn't really get you any jobs in space. Space tourism, chicken and egg problem relatively small amount of revenue possible. Mining asteroids, hard to make a spaceship go all the way out and bring very much back. But there's this other technology called space-based solar power, which is 101 years old now that hadn't worked, but it had a potential to generate a lot of revenue because there's 8 billion customers on the ground. And it works basically anywhere inside the orbit of Jupiter. And I went and researched it, trying to understand why it hadn't worked in the past. And in 2018, I decided that whoever did this needed to have a background in mass manufacture, energy systems, aerospace, and economics. And because of my career changing so many times, actually covering all those industries, if, I will, if it needs to happen, it probably needed to be me. So I incorporated a business, and here we are five years later, actually executing on that. So... That's my long-winded description of how to fail to success. This is a very interesting technology you've come up with. I've been looking at it. So where are you at with deployment of, of putting this out there in space? As a technology, things, things are relatively straightforward. The first engineering proposals were 1968. People have been working on this idea for a long time, and it's been technically feasible since probably the late 60s, early 70s. But it hadn't been economically viable. NASA did a big push in the late 70s. They have a system called the NASA Reference System that was designed in 1978. And they did a downtown cost analysis that went to the U.S. Congress in 1980 
and asked for a trillion dollars in today's money and said the first unit would be available in 2006. And they got told no. And they really remember that. It's 40 years later, and people at NASA and the Department of Energy. But the reasons why it failed back then and the reasons why it's possible today are completely different. Moore's Law, the advance of semiconductor manufacturing design, has advanced continuously since the late 60s. And 40 years of exponential improvements in performance means that semiconductors today are very inexpensive and very powerful and very energy efficient. And the underlying power electronics, when you're doing energy conversion from sunlight to radio waves in our case, you can have a much lighter, smaller, much higher efficiency system. So that's one thing. And related is automated manufacture. Even in the last decade, there have been enormous improvements in the cost effectiveness of automation. So robotic assembly and things of that nature have come down in price dramatically. There was a trade show here in Detroit a couple of months ago called Automate which is the largest robotics trade show globally. And I attended that just to get a good look at the state of the art. And I would argue there are a thousand vendors making robots today. So there are some big ones, the Kukas and the Kumaos of the world, but a lot of people have access to the ability to robots and they can be very powerful and work great. And of course, the last one is a commercial launch. Space-based solar power is an, is an energy supply, has been economically viable, since the advent of the SpaceX Falcon Heavy in 2018. So that system puts uh, 150 tons of lower orbit for $90 million. And that price point all by itself makes an appropriately designed system able to serve energy markets here on the ground. And if you do a good job with the system design, you could make those price points even better. So we have a solution set that we believe we'll be able to deploy that gets us to the price point we're interested in, and that kicked off number of technology validation steps. So if you're going to build space-based solar power, you're basically putting solar panels in space and you're beating it to the ground and receiving it by electricity. So very straightforward, but no one has ever built long distance wireless power transfer before. If you have a cell phone charger, that's called inductive charging. It, it is wireless, but it's not the same technology. We're using microwaves. Microwaves that are formed with photons. They're much longer wavelengths than the visible light, but they pass through clouds and weather very easily and because electromagnetics go from electricity to radio waves very easily, they're very efficient conversion process. Uh, we needed to demonstrate that you can build a wireless power transfer system that can reach from orbit to the ground. We use as our baseline a 40,000 kilometer distance, which is effectively the distance from a geostationary you know, or the apogee of a geostationary transfer orbit to the ground. So that's about 35,000 kilometer minimum. The Earth's radius is 6,000 kilometers. So 40,000 is about the furthest that you would be power if you're putting it to the edge of the planet. So those systems, you need to build and show that you can, they work. And we did a number of technology demonstrations over the last two years, culminating in a public demo in March of this year, Westfield, Indiana, which is just north of Indianapolis. We built a several hundred watt transmitter out of 6,400 individual antennas. If you guys can see my camera, this is a sample of the Antennas we make, we use circuit board manufacturing techniques. And we built the largest number of antenna wireless power transfer system ever. And we also moved the energy the furthest as anyone has ever done from the end. So we took wall power, AC electricity, transmitted it across to 100 meters, converted back to electricity at the far end. So that was our proof of concept that you can do long distance wireless power transfer. In fact, not only did we move power, but we used electronic beam steering to steer the energy from one target to another. So that no one has ever done that either, but it's relatively straightforward. We believe these are engineering challenges as opposed to solving physics challenges like our friends working on fusion are doing. As a technology, you need to solve that first. We've solved it. Now we're in the process of building our first fully integrated systems to test on the ground. So those will be more capable. So satellites, receivers tested to long distance on the ground, now going to the validation static stages that existing satellites go through and buy at the a pilot plant in orbit by the end of 12, about 100 kilowatts. It'll ride up on a redshirt mission, so really small, but it'll have on orbit assembly, it'll be you know, operating in orbit, and it'll transfer energy a significant amount from orbit. And with any luck, we'll be the first to do that. Our friends at Caltech did that recently, a few, a few weeks ago. They have a much smaller system, tens of watts instead of hundreds of kilowatts. Yeah, that'll allow us to validate our design and then start building commercial power 
seconds by the end of this tech. So that's where we are. We're early. We're a pre-seed stage startup, raising a seed stage at the moment. Yeah, all the underlying technical risk is being burned down. Major ones have already been burned down. So we're looking very much forward to building an operational system. This is really exciting technology. You said it takes, what, to get the first one up about $90 million? Much less. We think that commercial operation will be much more expensive. Final plant, we could probably do for somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 million, but that's including the ride on the rocket and the certification building of the ground station. So not too much money. These systems are relatively straightforward. People build CubeSats all the time. Our, our construction techniques look a lot more like circuit boards and electronics manufacturer than anything. Yeah, those are relatively inexpensive in grand scale compared to building, say, rockets, which cost billions. And development programs are very complicated because they are complicated. Too. Whereas building circuit boards and electronics, if they work on the ground in the atmosphere, they're going to work in microgravity or solid state. Nothing really changes there. And you can do it for much less capital. But building a factory, building a commercial system will take more equity investment, but the customers will pay for the power plants effectively, not the first of a company. So those costs that we'd be borne by the customers as opposed to us as the developer. So developers, we don't intend to own power plants. We think of us more as a GE or Siemens that builds power plants as opposed to an operator because operations as an independent power provider or other a user is a lot more complicated and not our specialty. So we're an engineer firm looking to build energy systems as opposed to how to operate. At what point does it make economic sense to, as far as the cost of energy from this type of operation versus a solar farm in a field? It makes sense today. We can fly using existing launch vehicles. And of course, we look forward to newer launch vehicles that are lower cost. But we can deliver energy to, we say that if you can get below $100 a kilowatt hour, which is 10 cents a kilowatt hour, that's about a $50 billion energy globally today. And I believe we're there with the Falcon Heavy. So our solution set meets that target already. And as system costs come down, especially commercial launch, you can start to address the global energy market. If you get below 60, that's like the floor of the electricity market globally. If you can get below 30, that addresses the entire $8 trillion global primary energy market, includes all fossil fuels, nuclear, everything. So as a technology, we believe space solar has the ability to reach the lowest cost of any energy technology. And that's to get to the electricity, of course. And once you have a fungible source of energy like electricity, you can use it to make clean, clean chemicals, clean fuels desalination, vertical farms, all sorts of use cases, which aren't possible because energy costs are too high. So today you can build space-based solar at cost competitive with existing energy. And it only gets better as you scale these systems. As economies of scale start coming in and as we make more and more systems, their unit cost comes. We believe it's economically feasible today. Yeah, so when you're targeting trillions of dollars in potential need, 50, $60 million costs, it's not much. Those are the R&D costs, right? Those aren't the deployment costs. These power plants uh, are competitive with terrestrial solar. They're cheaper than nuclear. And you get around clock energy. So you can deliver energy at night. These satellites are hot enough that they're out of the orb, out of the shadow of the earth. And the microwaves penetrate weather. So that means that we're doing terrestrial solar, especially those of us who live in high latitudes, which means that wintertime is a very cloudy, dim place. You can get the same amount of energy all the time no matter what season it is or where you are on the planet. Yeah, that allows you to scale. Trust your solar scale because it's very simple, straightforward. Lots of vendors are making the same basic cable that you can interface with the same way. Space solar is in the same category if you can do it. Simple. And as long as the commercial launch capabilities there, you can build and deploy and address basically what today is between 15 and 20% of global GDP is what the energy demand is. We used to pay 4%. Back when world economies were growing very rapidly. Existing energy solutions, once you get away from fossil fuels, become more and more expensive. The impact of renewables and intermittent energy has driven costs up. Transmission and distribution costs are generally much, much more than generation, no matter what market you're in. If you look at your energy bills, I pay about $220 a one hour here in Southeast Michigan. A very low penetration of renewables market because we're far enough north, doesn't really make sense to do solar. 
But the reason those costs have gone up is because of distribution costs, of the energy around, because of the impact of renewables. And that's true in many markets globally. So you can, if you can address that, eliminate the need for long distance distribution, energy storage. So batteries as a technology is very profitable today because of the diff huge difference in cost in energy between sunlight every uh, high amount of solar after the sun goes down. So you can just time shift that energy and make it back very quickly. But that's because the energy costs are too high all the time. The impact of renewables on conventional generation has meant that those assets can't operate during the day because there's enough solar and high uh, penetration markets like Southern California. And then their amortization costs go up because they're not generating power to pay back the investment, uh, the general equipment. And so that just means that backup to solar, which you can't operate at night, makes energy costs more expensive. And then the battery guys come in and say, hey, we're arbitraging this and they're going to make a lot of money because energy costs are higher than they should be if the base load generation was able to operate all the time. So there are lots of factors influencing the price of energy today. Globally, energy costs are mostly because trying to seize on fossil fuels. The replacements make economics worse. So we as a business are saying, hey, look, real goal is universal price makes the world a better place and uh, energy costs underlie everything. So your food costs, your transportation costs, housing costs, everything is rooted in energy costs. Our solutions don't bring energy costs down. You're making the world less prosperous, not more prosperous. So if you think about it, we in the West, those of us who live in North America, average about nine kilowatts of primary energy consumption across every man, woman, child in the U.S. The global average is about 1.8. So you know, 20% of what we experience in the West, and there's about three quarters of a billion that have zero. So if you consider yourself prosperous, most of the world is already in energy poverty. And they can't afford these new solutions or they don't have access to them because of economics globally. So if you want to make the world a fun place, make energy cheap everywhere. And that's something that we at Burner Souls. Yeah, it's a good mission. And because it's sustainable, it will also be a revenue generating business because it's a real yeah. problem. Yeah. In fact, if we talk about the way to make these systems work, we're saying, hey, look, you paid over 20 years, you get very low cost to pass on to your customers. Then if we've done our job, they'll last 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years because they're solid state electronics in orbit and your energy costs, once the period of amortization is over, it's effectively free. So what does that look like if energy costs were free? I can't imagine anything bad. You know, it's all to the good. Yeah, I was looking at your product and we're one step away from the theoretical Dyson sphere with this. So that'll be um, your next. You can, you can argue that once you have space-based solar power serving your entire planet's needs, you're a type one civilization. You're a car car ship type one. So it's close. Dyson sphere, it'll take us a little while to get there, but uh, yeah, it's totally possible once you are able to economically leave the planet, have people living where you for sure. One last question, John, if you could give advice to your younger self and tell you one thing, what would it be? I would argue that self-confidence and the ability to go off and do crazy things, anyone can do that. And being conservative and not taking chances early in your career is probably the wrong way to do it. If there's any, any time to take chances in your career, you should do it early because the repercussions of failure are small in the grand scheme of things. Once you sure and you have family and other things it's harder to take those risks so take them early if you want to join a startup and do something interesting do it early in your career you can do it late in your career uh, 50 almost 53 but i've been in startups for a decade believe in it and frank frankly the startup ecosystem wasn't that great in the mid 90s and the internet wasn't what we have today and it wasn't it's easy to yeah find information on how these things work. So in today's, if I was in my twenties today, certainly there are many interesting things you can go out and do. And the payoff is enough that you could do whatever you want later in your career. So those are take risks, try things. It's not as bad as you think if you think. We got tips. So if one of our listeners wanted to learn more about your company, get in touch with you, how could they do? So I'd say the best way is find us on the internet or www.vertisolos.space. 
And if you think about it, virtus is the root of virtue. It means our or solus means sun, not space is space. So we're space old hours of our business. We have a contact form there. You can read all about us, read our blog, look at the wonderful uh, CGI we have around mm -hmm. what our system looks like, and we can pull us on LinkedIn as well. So reach out if you want to know more. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, John, for coming on the show. And thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. Make sure to smash that subscribe button. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki with Cosmic Web Design and Development, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.